chill out for a while to, to uh, loosen up some of that intentions. So we're going to talk about something that's very needed in this day and time. A lot of ball is going on. And God's got it.
supplying our needs according to your riches and glory. And Father, as you supply our needs this morning, we just ask you to be with the pastor as he delivers the message, Lord God. And Father, just when we depart, we can give testimony, not only of what you've done in our lives, but how you were here this morning. And in Christ Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. 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 I, 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 feel like, I feel like we need to, we just heard some, the test of little Walter. Test of little Walter. He, he may have some kind of a genetic disorder. And we're going to test him, but we know that God, 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 God has his plan. Amen. Bring him on up here. We're going to pray for him. Let's go. Come on, dog. You didn't know which water I was talking about. Now, don't bring your dog up here. You can leave that out. Leave that out of the car. Go to little Walter. I put him in his mask and I'll be done with him.
Hey, we're gonna go, we're gonna do something very special right now. We're gonna have communion. So I want everybody, if everybody, get, did everybody get one of these? If you didn't get one, raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Everybody get a communion, a communion cup? Everybody get a communion cup. Okay. read this verse. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and, he, and said, Take it, this is my body, is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This, this do ye as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so that he eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. But it's caused many weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For who would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay, I want you right now remember, when this scripture is not saying that it, it, this is not, uh, unworthily, it's not talking about your position with God. And it's talking about your position with everything around you. It's an adverb. If, if you've got the wrong attitude, then God says you better get it right. Amen? Because if you do this with the wrong attitude, problems are coming. Amen? Let's pray. Father? I thank you right now. I ask you to touch us, Lord. If there's any attitudes, any actions that you're not pleased with, touch us right now. Lord, help us, God, to know that you got us in control. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So he said, first he said, take the bread. So peel back the first little part there and get your little wafer out. The Bible said that he took the bread. He he, he blessed it. He broke it and blessed it. He said, take heed, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now get in the cup. He said, this is my blood in the New Testament. Drink it as often as you do in remembrance of me. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. All right, get your Bibles out. That was, was that a hand clap of praise or was that a get by? Let's get a hand clap of praise. Come on. There you go. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, uh, how many, how many know that life will change you? Amen. You know, the same things that you talk big and bad about today, you know, and it's amazing how before you have children, you got 25 ways to take care of them. And then when you get, to, when you have 25 children, you got no ways to take care of them. You know, you don't hang out all figured out. Well, uh, uh, I was talking to somebody, the lady said, I have five siblings. Uh, three sisters and two brothers. One night, I was, she said, one night she was chatting with her mom about how she had changed as a mother from the firstborn to the last. And she laughed and she told me how she mellowed over the years. When your oldest sister called or sneezed, I called the ambulance. When your youngest brother swallowed a dime, I just told him it was coming out of his allowance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things do have a way to change. They do change. Life changes us. And, and again, this has just been a, uh, th this week, just the Lord's just been dealing with me in a very special way. And like I said, uh, if you follow Bill Lines for the Kingdom on Wednesday nights, you may have heard some of this already. But again, it's because God's just speaking it to me and saying, get this message out. And so I, I really, really, uh, because of all the things I have seen and all the things that you have seen and the things that we've gone over, we've been through a lot in the last two years. 
our world has been through, I mean, there, there's been our generations that went through two world wars. There's generations that went through the Civil War and the Spanish-American War and, you know, all this stuff. And then, uh, I mean, there's all these kind of wars that people have gone through, but the war that we're fighting now is so different because the war we're fighting terror, and terror does not have uh, a region. Terror is everywhere. And you don't even know who you're fighting half the time because of the way terrorism works. And then we have a great, and, and with the COVID, the COVID, COVID to me has become one of the biggest terrorists that we face. It terrorizes people. And the Bible says in the end of the last days, fathers will be divided against son and mother against daughter, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and nations are rise against nation, and there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. You see all this stuff, but a lot of this now is coming so fast because of, I call it, the great terrorist COVID. All right, because it is, it's, it's, it's caused a lot of problems. And so, so I just wanted to uh, uh, talk about something that's very dear to my heart, something that, that, that I do not, I'm telling you, I, I, I don't like to give up. I don't like to give in, I don't like to give up. And, and I see a lot of people in this last day with this stuff happening, they're not necessarily just giving up, but they're just giving over. There's a difference. Giving up is not a fight. And giving over is like, I'll just do it your way. Right, if that's what you want, that's what we're going to do. You know, and, and what it's done is uh, Christ actually has been put on, not only on the back burner, Christ has been a lot of times been pushed so far behind that, you know, it, it's, it's just unbelievable a nation founded on God and his principles. You know, uh, there was even talk uh, during when they were when they were first coming up with the Constitution of the United States, I believe it was a British man, told George Washington, and he said, I'm afraid that your Constitution is nothing more than a sail without an anchor. And George Washington said, no, God is our anchor. Amen. Amen. But now with God being pulled out, again, we're, at this day and time, this last two years, we've been a sail without an anchor. Okay? And it, it's scary, a scary thought. So, uh, again, I was going to do this. This was going to be all done today. And now, I, this morning, I put part one up there. I'm not even sure how many parts we're going to have. Uh, at least, we're going to go there. And then we're going back. we got holidays. But we're going to still do Revelation in between the holidays. But it's going to be kind of different with Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And so, so, so again, uh, we're going to be in Revelation a while. But I will tell you this. When, when we go to the bowls, it's not going to be like at one bowl a week. Like 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 uh, the seals, it's going to be probably two or three or four bowls at a time. Okay, like the way I eat cereal, I usually eat cereal two or three bowls at a time. How about y'all? I like Jeffrey Bodine a box of cornflakes won't last long with me. Okay, so so when we start going through Revelation, there's going to be some times where we just we we we, we, we pull up several things at once because if we didn't, we'd be here till you know uh, another year or two. Sorry. So it's going to be, and plus this stuff is, once this starts happening in, in uh, the second half, the, the Great Tribulation, things are going to be absolutely winding down, although it's going to be harder than ever, it's going to be winding down. So, so, so here we go. Why you shouldn't give up when the going gets tough, all right? Uh, get your Bible out. I've got several scriptures, just, but just stay right there. You don't have to even get up. Just stay right there. And, and we're going to... Uh, 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 I'm going to read some scriptures for you. Uh, not giving up when things get tough. So, so first, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, put your finger there. And then turn to Philippians chapter 4, put your finger there, and then go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Okay. Go to Philippians chapter 4, put your finger there. Then go to Ephesians chapter 6 and watch. <laughs> All right, ready? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. This is our message for today. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. This is our message for today. Period. Not just here. I'm talking about when you step outside these doors. Ready? Verse 10. Finally, my brethren... 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now we think that we go to the sixth chapter and that's all about spiritual warfare. Actually, the whole book of Ephesians is about spiritual warfare. But the very first part of Ephesians is all about relationships and how to handle yourself amongst people, amongst your family. But then chapter six, then it gets really deep and then it says, and finally, when it says finally, that means that that's capping off what was the finishing of the letter. So the letter of Ephesians first is about relationships, which is spiritual warfare. And then it goes finally, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand, therefore. And having done everything within your power to stand. You put on all the armor of God. You've crossed all the T's. You've dotted all the I's. And Satan's still coming. You've done everything you can to keep things on the up and up, to keep yourself afloat, to keep God's message going forth, and it still seems like many times it's just too much to do. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. That's wild. That's very powerful because right now in this day and time, there's sometimes I don't even know what to say or do when I get here and some of the stuff that's going on. And so... What I do is, is when I'm not sure what to do, I just stand. Just stand. Sometimes you just got to stand. Because if you don't stand, you know, you know, remember that old country song, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything? Well, well, the same way. Sometimes, you know, I, I don't know the right answer, but I know the wrong answer. The wrong answer is giving in. Okay? So if I know the right answer, I'm just going to stand. I'm going to stand on my principles. And if you stand on your principles... I guarantee that everybody's going to agree with it. That's okay. You stand on your principles because you know what you're going to be judged by? You're going to be judged by His Word and your character. And His Word and your character makes up your principles. Okay? So, now turn to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 12. Let's go to verse 11, excuse me. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I've learned in whatever state I am, therewith be content. Wow. Huh. Wow. Even with the great terrorist COVID, which is wreaking havoc in our government, wreaking havoc in our homes, wreaking havoc in our society, wreaking havoc in the world. It is tearing people all to pieces. Whatever state I've learned, I mean, in the just pop in my head, I learned that whatever state I am, we've had two years, therefore, to be content. Not just content to be content's sake, but be content in God. I know that I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. But everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Let's say that together. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, that you are alive and well on the throne, Father. And I know, God, that you've got everything under control. I ask you right now, Lord, to help us, God, to see, know, and understand that something very powerful is taking place in our midst. And, Lord, knowing that we're not serving a losing Savior. We're not fighting a losing battle. We're not standing on nothing alone. We're standing on your power and your anointing. And we're standing on what you said was going to happen, and we know that. And I also know, God, that something special is getting ready to happen to your church. Lord, before it goes out of here in a blaze of glory in the rapture, it's going to cause a blaze in this land. And I thank you for it, God. I thank you, God, that you trusted us enough to let us be allowed to be born in this generation. We're not here by accident. You didn't go oops when we were born. No, you knew that we were going to be here for such a time as this. 
And just like, uh, just like all the others that went before us in the Old Testament for such a time as this, let us be Esthers. Uh, let us be standers. Let us know that God, you've put us here for a reason at this time. And it's not to give up, not to give in, not to just go along to get along with Satan, but make a stand on your word, for your word is what we're going to be judged by, and your word is what we live by. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, now again, I, this is just going to be the introduction, but the more I studied this morning, the more I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, stop right here. Stop. And I said, and I even said, well, Lord, this is my intro. He said, no, this is your sermon. So this morning, here it comes. Ready? Four reasons that you shouldn't give up when things get going tough. This is just the intro, but now it's sermon part one. <laughs> Amen. Life can never take you where God's grace can't sustain you. So relax. I gotta say it again. <laughs> Life can never take you where God's grace cannot sustain you. So relax in it. Y'all say relax in God's grace. Tell somebody you need to be relaxing. Amen. Tell them I can tell by the I can tell by the look on your face you ain't relaxed. And tell them. <coughs> all right, now we're gonna have a fight. We're gonna have all kinds of fights going on here. Amen. So, so, so. <laughs> all right. Praise God. God is good, isn't He? So I'm just gonna take relax. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go down with relax. This will still be the intro, but it's not the intro. It is the sermon, and we're gonna read a lot of scriptures, and I'm gonna read them. With you putting your finger in the book like before, before was just practice, and some of y'all really did good, and some of y'all will. You'll be all right. <laughs> all right, y'all. Y'all ready? Get your Bible. We're going we're gonna to run through some scriptures, and we're going to read them together. Amen? So we're going to talk about relax. Somebody say relax. All right. <laughs> all right. So the first R. Remember, I like to do these all the time. These acrostics. I like the acronyms and acrostics. So first, the first letter is R, okay? This right here is going to help you out a whole lot today. This is going to help mend some relationships. This is going to help you uh, actually say something to somebody that you ain't said something to a long time because you think they have got lost all their sense and, and, and you know, blah, 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 blah. Ready? Get ready. Realize nobody is perfect. I know some of y'all just went, is he talking about me? Yes. Yes, there's only one perfect one, that's Jesus. Remember I told you about the man's in church and the preacher says there's only one perfect one and the man in the back raised his hand and he kept raising his hand the preacher said, sir, didn't you just hear me say there's only one perfect one? He said, preacher, I hate to disagree with you, but there was two. He said, can you please tell me who the first the other one is? He said, my, my wife's first husband. <laughs> okay. Burn the book. Okay. So, nobody is perfect. I love this. Nothing is perfect except your words. I guarantee you, even with your education and your training and you got things under control and you can do so much so many ways, I guarantee you that something one day is going to happen. You're going to realize, wait a minute, there's a better way to do this. There's another way to do this. I can do this a different way. Or there's some people that you've been holding grudges against because you thought they were absolutely off the wall and you find out later on. Maybe they weren't so crazy after all. Amen? Amen? Somebody's laughing now. <laughs> All right. Nobody is perfect. We all are at the same level at the foot of the cross. We all have to talk to God the same way. We all have to have his grace. We all are apt to mess up. We are all apt to ruin it from time to time. From time. What does that mean that you say we didn't step into anything and what now? I must have done it because it didn't fall out of stepping That's right. <laughs> That's right. Didn't fall out and step in anything. Amen. I use it all the time, but I keep messing it up even when I look. See, I'm not even perfect with that. Amen. So, 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 look at somebody, look at somebody and say, I realize. To tell them, I realize. I realize. 
that you're not perfect. That you're not perfect. <laughs> now look back at the same person and say, that makes me realize that, makes me realize. that we're in good company. <laughs> Amen. All right. Number one, relax. Or, or realize nobody's perfect. Number two, enjoy. And we're talking about relax. This is how you relax. Okay? If, 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 if you don't want to relax, then, then this none of this is for you. If you want to stay tied up and tensed up and mad in the world, then this is the wrong one for you. But if you're ready to have some peace in your life, you're ready to have some comfort in your life, and tired of everything rubbing you the wrong way, then this isn't for you. I'm not talking about going along to get along. I'm talking about letting God do something special in your life. A whole different thing. I can still stand on my morals. I can still stand on God's word. I can still have my principles. But when I, when I think about this, it helps me better to take in what's going on around me. Okay? Enjoy God's unconditional love. Turn to Romans chapter 5. We're going to have a Bible drill today. I don't have it marked in my Bible, so y'all can say, he already had it marked in his Bible. No, not today. Romans chapter 5. Yes, Romans is in the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, that, mine's 1738. Okay. Romans chapter 5. Y'all got to say amen. 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 All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, justified means just if I'd never done it. Being justified by faith, justified just as I justified, I've never done it. Meaning, my peace and my comfort from God comes because once I read this, I understand that He takes all my imperfections and all my all my mess ups, and He does something special. He takes them all together and does something special. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we have glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation, that tribulations work in patience. Oh, wow. You want me to stop or you want to keep on going? Tribulation works patience. That word patience, believe it or not, is cheerful endurance. That word patience is cheerful endurance. Knowing this, the tribulation work of patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is in us, or given unto us. Here it goes. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. One more time. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In other words, when we couldn't do anything about what we were going through, we couldn't handle anything because we were sinners in due time. He died for us. But not only in due time, he died for us when we couldn't do anything about our sin situation. Even now in COVID, the terror of COVID, and things are going crazy around us, and there's all kinds of all kinds of stuff going on around us that you would never expect, and families dividing up because of it, and things happening of that nature. Know this: Did you look? Here it goes. The tribulation working patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And again, when we're yet without strength, and we can't do anything about it, Christ has already died to take care of business. Look at somebody and say, Christ has already died to take care of business. Amen. Died. He's already died. So, enjoy God's unconditional love. Matter of fact, try this sometime. It's so easy. So easy, especially in this last day. It's so easy to get so tied up in what's going on around us that we actually, I know that I'm the only one, so y'all go ahead and please forgive me. Right now I'm the only one in here that has a tendency to become judgmental. When I see somebody doing a haphazard, slowly, could care less job, I know I'm the only one. Y'all forgive me, please. 
Or I'm the only one that gets judgmental when somebody doesn't seem to even want to act like they even know I'm in the room. I know, so y'all being quiet, so y'all saying, yeah, look at y'all pointing, quit pointing at me. Matter of fact, if you have one of those sticks with a V in it, you can take it and start doing like this, and then we go and try it back on you. Because we all, we all sometimes get tired. I went six weeks without my APAP machine. Praise God, I got it now. Oh, God, is that a big difference. Woo! Doing great now. But, but for six weeks, I told the Lord that last week, I said, Lord, if you don't do something quick, I'm going to hide under a rock somewhere until it comes in. But I found myself not having patience with people like I should. But when you practice and enjoy God's unconditional love, you'll find patience that you didn't know you had. When I can sit back and, and instead of eating somebody up, I can sit back and say, wait a minute. They're going through battles too. They've got hardships going on. And, and I'm not the only one that's going through this thing. And so, so, you know, again, practicing God's unconditional love will really, really help you in what's going on around us. Now, here we go. Y'all ready for number L? Number L. Letter L. Now I'm stepping on people's feet and I'm kicking them in the mouth. Ready? I'm kicking my own self in the mouth when I see this. How many of you give it to God when you can't figure it out? We just read that having done all the stand, stand. It didn't, it didn't say anything there about you figuring everything out, then stand. It said you give it to God, and then you put on the whole armor of God. You do everything God said, doing having stand, having, having an all to stand His way, stand. It didn't say nothing else after you've done everything you can to try to fix it, can't give it to Him. There's, nothing, there's two entirely different scriptures. One comes from the book from the book of, of Ephesians. The other one comes from the book of whatever your name is. Amen. So, so let God handle things. I try this and every now and then. I think He's not doing a fast enough job. Again, y'all, y'all pointing me. It's okay. I'll take the heat. Sometimes I don't think He's doing a fast enough job, or sometimes I don't like the way He's doing it. Or sometimes he, he, he's not, he didn't handle the way I thought it should be handled, and so I might get upset. But after I find out my way don't work, then sometimes then I decide, I'll let God handle this. I know none of y'all ever done that. Right. <laughs> like Benny says, you mean this day, today? That's right. So let God handle it. When you take, look, look, and y'all, y'all pilot, you've got one pilot in here. But, but uh, uh, I pastored several pilots, and uh, I had this pilot coming to the side one day and told me, he said, he said, let me tell you something. I said, what we're talking about, tailspins or something, tell me to you. He said, let me, tell, let me talk to you. I said, what is it, brother? He said, I was taught that when I went in a tailspin, unless the plane had been shot and the plane had been damaged, he said, I was taught then when the, tail, when the plane went into, a, went into a tailspin, if I tried to correct it, I would end up dead. He said, I was taught that when I went into a tailspin, again, unless you're being shot in battle, you're shot, you got missed out that way. He said, I was taught when I went into a tailspin to take my hand off the stick because there's something inside that plane that's built to self-correct. Am I getting close there, Brother Steve? Take your hand off the stick, and then once it gets out of tailspin, then take your hand and put it back on the stick. Guess what? I've crashed and burned them many a time because I wouldn't take my hand off the stick. Not in a real plane, but in my life. Just couldn't take my hand off the stick. I got this, God. I got it. Do you need my help? I'll call you in a minute, Lord. I got it. But if you let go off it, I got it, Lord. <sighs> let go of the stick. Let God correct the situation. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Somebody come on, say amen. All right, get ready. Do a, turn to Psalm 68. We're going to do some, do some running back and forth. Psalm 68. I know you might have come and spake in Revelation. Well, you're getting a Revelation right now. My first revelation this morning was when I woke up my normal, after, like 20 after 5, I realized it weren't 20 after 6. That was my first revelation. So I'm about to sleep and let my clock, praise God for cell phones that, you know, if you put your alarm clock in your cell phone, you ain't got to worry about getting up late because it, it knows when to change. Except for my dad, he got a little cheap lock, the old cheap phone, he has to wind his up. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm, <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 68. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, my daddy was so tight coming up. Said he, we, he said every time we'd hear the, the ice cream truck come through the community, if we heard it, if we heard it making, doing this little jingle, was making music, it meant that they were out of ice cream. <laughs> One of my favorite memories of Bethany <laughs> was I was up on the roof in, in, in Williamson. I'm up on the roof up there up at the chimney working on something. I can't remember now. I, I mean, it was, it was pitiful because I was up there and I was in a mess. And I was trying my best to, to handle things. And she's down below. I had her watch in case it hit the ground. She could call somebody. <laughs> and here it goes. Da, 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 she said, Dad, there's an ice cream truck. I said, Beth, my money's down. And she goes, Dad, that's the ice cream truck. And I'm trying to get hurry up. She goes, Dad, you're going to leave. you got to come on down. Come on, Dad. And all I could think about was, you know, my dad, that means you're out of ice cream. So I, I climbed down the ladder. <laughs> and I run in the house. And I found the money. And I said, no, we walked together to the ice cream truck. Then I went back. <laughs> And got back up and climbed up on that ladder. And got back up in that chimney. Amen. All right. Psalm 68. Verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. One little fellow sang it. Let God arise. Let his enemies be splattered. That's the song we sing. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. This is what they sang every time before they went in the wilderness march for 40 years. They sang this song every time they got ready to go on the wilderness journey. As they were going through the bad stuff, they would always say, we're not sure what's coming up, so we need God to arise to help us. I'm here to tell you something right now. When you let God handle things, I don't know what's coming up. I never know what's going to happen or what the doctor's going to tell somebody or you know, uh, my mother-in-law with Alzheimer's trying to help her and the cellulitis. I, I just never know what's going to happen. So if we're in the house, I always say, God, you got to arise. God, you got to arise. I need you. When I was a chaplain at, at Pitbull Hospital working 12-hour shifts, and they, you had your pager and they would call you or call you over the overhead, overhead uh, 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 loudspeaker. Uh, you never knew exactly what you were going to face anytime. Even if they told you it was code blue, you never knew what you were going to face. So all the way, once they told me the room number or whether it was an emergency room or, or wherever it's at, intensive care, all the way up there, I would say, let God arise. Let God arise. Let God arise. Lord, you got to tell me what to do and what to say. And you only had that training, you only got like 12 seconds. Once you walk in the room, you got 12, maybe 15 seconds to, to figure out what's going on before you can start ministering to people. 15 seconds. Can you imagine? You only got 15 seconds. Wow. You come in and you look around and you figure out what's going on. You go in and make a, make, look around and see what's happening so you can know what, what to do, what to say. Because they don't want you to get understand and just stand there looking at them. You got to say something. You know, and so if you already assess the situation, 15 seconds, 30 at the most, then you're good. But I could do it on my own. So guess what? All the way there, let God arise. Let God arise. Let your enemies be scattered. Let God arise. Let God arise. Let God arise. Learn to let God handle things. That word arise means to establish. 
It means to become powerful. It means to raise up a standard. Let God arise. Let him be in charge. Let him establish. Let him lead. Let him guide. Learn to let God handle things. Does it mean you're going to handle things exactly like you want? No. Nope. Not a bit. What it does mean is that God's got this. Let me tell you something. Control. We all want control. But that's the biggest problem that we have in our lives. We want control. We want to be able to control our destiny. We want to be able to control what we're having for lunch today. We want to be able to control how our car is going to act. We want to be able to control control. Mary Andretti said, if everything's under control, then you're going too slow. Control's a myth. We don't control anything. Nothing. God is in control. Let God handle things. Uh, here we go. It is good stuff. Amen. Three of you like it anyway. Ready? Act in faith. Not fear. Act in faith. Not fear. You see, listen carefully. When we allow fear to penetrate us, it doesn't just penetrate our mind. Listen carefully. Fear penetrates our mind. It penetrates our heart. It penetrates our emotions. It penetrates our spirituality. Fear does not act alone in your body. Fear pulls everything together. Emotionally, mentally, physically, everything. Everything is pulled in together. It's like a vacuum. Fear is like a vacuum. And when fear takes a hold of you, you can't think. Sometimes you can't even pray because fear has gotten the best of you. Fear paralyzes your brain. It paralyzes your immune system. But the biggest thing that fear paralyzes is your faith. And so when fear gets a hold of us, and there's been a lot of fear in the last couple of years, a lot of fear. And, and so when fear begins to paralyze you, then you'll find problems. So let's get your Bible out. Turn, turn to Isaiah. Isaiah, first let's turn to Psalms since we're already there. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. I know I got y'all all discombobulated. Fear, uh, Psalm 27. Psalm 27. I told you this, this came to me this morning, so that's why I'm doing like this. I didn't have time to put it all up in here because it was just like that. I believe God was saying, all right, you got in the way. I got something I want to do. Okay? Psalm 27. Verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My light and my salvation. Which means he guards me. That's not just only talking about spiritual. It's talking about emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Remember, fear is like a vacuum. It sucks your brain. I mean, it's like making you like a zombie. It just sucks you in and, and paralyzes you in all different areas of your life. So, so here you go. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came up upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a, host of the, though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that which will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in, for in the time of trouble you shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. Shall he hide me? He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore I will offer into his, in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Now turn to Psalm 46. Hope y'all write these down. You know you can't remember writing anyway, but... This morning, the Lord kept telling me so fast, I, I, I'm out like I wrote in Hebrew, Greek, and possum track all at the same time. Okay, what were you doing? Isaiah 4, I mean, Psalm 46. I 
remember the very first suicide that I preached a funeral for. I was paralyzed because I didn't know what to say or what to do when I had all these well-meaning Christians trying to tell me what I had to say and what I had to do. I just put Beverly and all the young people on a plane to go to Jamaica, so they were gone. I come back from the airport, and on my front door is this young man's brother had just committed suicide, and they want you to come minister to the family and want you to do the funeral. So not only was it a shock to hear, but my support system, physical support system, was gone too. And here I was, and I had all those well-meaning people well wrong. And so I called my district overseer. And I said, I don't know what to do. He said, why? And I told him what had happened. He said, let me ask you one question. And I believe this will help. I said, lay it over, bro. He said, are you God? That was the question. Are you God? I said, there ain't no way. He said, well, then let God do it. Let God do it. I said, how? He says, I don't know. You're the pastor. <laughs> Remember from helping me to, you know, tripping me up. He said, but I promise you, God will tell you what to say. And it won't be what these other people are telling you to say. I promise you. I said, all right. So I went to prayer. And this was the message that I used at that graveside of that first suicide. And every time I pull this out and see Psalm 46, I hear in my head, are you God? No. Then back up and let God handle it. I hear it every time I pull out this scripture. And I've used it hundreds of times to bring comfort in the middle of some of the worst tragedies. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength a very present help and trouble. I mean, he ain't going anywhere. He's right there. By the fact, he's there before everybody else gets to you. Therefore, we will not fear that the earth be removed. Now, talk about fear. Remember, fear paralyzes everything. That we will not fear that the earth be removed, that the mountains be carried away in the midst of the sea, that the waters thereof roar and be troubled, that the mountains shall shake with the swelling thereof. Selah, there's a river. The streams of earth shall make glad the city of God and the holy place and the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, and the kings were removed. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he's made in the earth. He maketh the wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, and cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Here it is. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. Verse 10. Be still. And know that I am with you. That word be still doesn't only mean to stop. To cease from activity. It also means to take what's bothering you. And give it to God and let go of it. Give it to God and let go of it. I can't tell you how many times I've read that walking down the corners of the cancer center with Bethany when she was in her fix. I read it over and over again and I will say, okay God, I don't know what to do. I'm giving it to you. Help me take my hands off of it. And about the time I started feeling a little better, then Linda got the blood clots in her lungs, and then they had them both up there at the same time. The doctor told me they could both die for several days. And I would again get in, walk the halls, or go sit down by the window, and I would read this song to myself. After I read the song to myself, I would say, okay, God, I'm being still because I don't know what to do. I'm giving it to you. I'll let it go. And peace in the middle of pain, always came. 
I didn't say peace replaced the pain. I said peace in the middle of pain. There's a difference. Some of us want all the pain gone. But God will use that pain. He will. He never wastes your pain. God never wastes pain. But he brought peace in the middle of the pain. So now, remember this. When we step out in faith, when we step out, God steps in. When we step out, God steps in. Say it with me. When we step out, God steps in. I'm not stepping out in the middle of We step out in faith, then God steps in. Watch this. Watch this. God will take your natural when you step out. God takes your natural and adds his super to it. And what you do becomes supernatural. Wow. God takes your ordinary and puts his extra in it. And what you do becomes extraordinary. When we step out, then God steps in. Then finally, I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready to close. That don't mean anything. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> Exchange your perfectionism for God's peace. Here we go again, a medal. You know what perfectionism is? Perfectionism actually is based on fear. Did you know that? Perfectionism is based on fear. We just talk, we talk about fear. How can perfectionism be based on fear? We're afraid we're not going to be good enough. We're afraid we're not going to get it done right. We're afraid that it's never going to, we're never going to measure up. So because we're afraid, we micromanage. And we micromanage and micromanage and micromanage until we think we've got it all figured out and then we become perfectionists. And once you become a real perfectionist, literally, it's based on fear. You micromanage everything. You just want to go ahead and forget anybody's helping you. They're not there. Because you had to be perfect. Amen? I promise you, although you might think I'm perfect, I'm not. <laughs> I promise you, I'm not perfect. If you don't believe me, just ask anybody that lives within a mile of me. I'll tell you. Amen. I'm not perfect. Okay? So, exchange your perfectionism for God's peace. Okay? So now, watch this. Fear not. Again, fear not because he's because with us. So watch this. Get, get ready. Let me just go ahead and move this all around. Get ready to quit. I promise you, get ready to quit. Now, fear shifts my focus from power to problems. Fear shifts my focus from power to to problems right now how many how many because every time we turn on the tv what we hear about hospitals we hear about shutdowns we hear about people being fired because they won't take the shot we hear about this we hear about that we hear all kinds of things going on they got to be tested uh uh on and on and on it's all it's like it's like we're consumed with all of this information. And everywhere you go, people are wearing masks, and some of them are not wearing masks, and you know, and it just and, 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 and it just drives me crazy because you cannot turn on the television without hearing some of this stuff and, and, and it just ah it just gets worse and worse and worse instead of getting keep telling it's gonna be getting better, it's not getting better. All this stuff going around is getting worse and not only is still stuff shut down, some stuff will never open up, but it does open up, it's gonna have a new group of people because the old people got fired and I just on and on and on and on. Oh, life's changing so fast it's hard to even understand, but that's all part of the plan to condition us so when the Antichrist comes on the scene, we're going to be so worn out, so burdened, so down, so zombified, you know, uh, that, 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 that we just kind of just, just give me some relief. I just want some relief. Just, just give me some good news, just a, a little bit of good news. So I see this. Fear may not stop the problem. Or excuse me, faith, and faith may not stop the problem, but it will bring peace and comfort and help. It takes the problem out of our hands. And puts it into God's. Amen? Amen. Matthew 14. Peter, when he saw him walking on the water, he said, Lord, if it be, be you, bid me come. Jesus said, come on. He jumped out and he starts walking. And all of a sudden he starts taking his eyes off of Jesus. Starts looking all around him at all the problems, all the storms. And he starts to sink. And all he can say now is, Lord, save me. Before, watch this. 
His tune changed. His tune was, if it be you, Lord, bid me come. Some of y'all right now said, if it's you, God, let me know. I'm ready. And by the time you start really getting good at it, you start moving. God's doing something. All of a sudden, you start looking at everything around you. And it went from, I'm ready, God, to save me. It's amazing how the voice changed just like that. Remember, walking on the water saying, Lord, bid me come. Here I am. I'm getting out of the boat. Lord, I'm on the way to save me. Because he let fear take over. Fear will never stop the problem, but it extends and it compounds the problem. It depletes peace, your comfort, and it keeps your problem in your hand. So now, one more scripture, and then I'm going to close. Get your Bible out. One more scripture. i got to read it. I just don't want to talk about it. I want to read it. All right. It's 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. If you don't know where 2 Kings is, it's right after 1 Kings. Second Kings. Second Kings, chapter six, verse eight. Mark these, mark them. These are some powerful scriptures. 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou plans that, that thou shalt... That, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for hither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place where, which the man had told him and warned him and saved him there, not once nor twice. In other words, the Syrian king kept trying to ambush the Israeli king. And every time he tried to ambush him, he was forewarned many, many times. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is, is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah the prophet, that is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great hut and a great host that came by night and compassed the city about. Now this place is packed now with Syrians. And when the servant of the man of God rose up early and gone forth, behold, a host can pass the city both with horses and chairs, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be, be with us are more than they which be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see, he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chairs of fire round about Elijah. Wow. Wow. Let's just stop it right there. Elijah's servant went out in the morning to do his duties, and everywhere he looks, the enemy has infiltrated. Infiltrated everywhere. He comes back in and says, we don't stand a chance. They're here to kill us. They got us. We know what they're asking everybody. Where are you at, Elijah? So we can carry you back. And he said, dude, calm down. He said, I know it's looking bad for the home team, but I need you to go outside again. And this time with a different perspective. And God opened the man's eyes so he could see what's really going on. He walks back outside, the enemy's still there. It hadn't moved, hadn't changed. Enemies everywhere. But he looks up above the city, and there's chariots of fire everywhere he can see. And he goes, Oh, now I see. You see, the situation hadn't changed, the circumstance had not changed, but his vision changed. When his vision and perspective changed, 
It's amazing how he changed. You know, uh, one of my favorite movies is Quickly Down Under. Y'all know it was a spiritual movie, didn't you? Very spiritual. Because at the very end, when they're coming to get him, the British soldiers are coming to get Quigley. And while Quigley's looking up and they get ready to take him out, he looks up around him. And all those natives, or as far as you can see, the natives are around. And all I keep thinking about, okay, Quigley should have been called Elijah. Very powerful. Every time I see it, my heart beats really hard. I said, thank you, Lord, for quickly. <laughs> God, y'all say this to me, God, open my eyes to what's really happening and to know circumstances may not change, but you haven't either. And I trust you to take care of business. In the name of Jesus, help me see the chariots of fire. In the name of Jesus, amen. Everybody stand. Brandon, come here and play something lightly. You know, again, this was, this was the introduction, but now it might not be in the sermon, but that's okay. Terrorism is built on one big circumstantial possibility, and that is they can scare you to death. If they can scare you to death, whoever the terrorist is, if they can scare you, then they can control you. That's terrorism. If I can scare you, I can control you. Amen? Mm -hmm. If I can scare you, I can control you. Let me ask you a question. Why do I want to be afraid of what's going on around me and let it control me when I can give it to God, be still, and know that he's God? Because the Bible says we're sin abound. Grace did much more abound. So with the crazy mess going on now, guess what it's telling me? God's really up to something. And he's waiting for the right people to go, you know what? I refuse to be driven by fear. Instead, I'm going to be led by faith. Here it is. Are you going to be driven by fear or led by faith? Yeah. Driven by fear, led by faith. I choose to be led by faith. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, let's start praying. Father, pray with me. Ready? Father, Father. I love you. Father. I praise your name. Father. I ask you, I ask you to you. help me to give myself 100% to you. Help me not to be driven by fear, but led by faith. And I know these times are not easy. But God, you never moved like you do the best in the easy times. It was always the tough times that you proved yourself to be very strong. I ask you right now to help me rededicate myself to you and to trust you more than ever. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God is so awesome. Come on, everybody, give Lord a hand clap of praise. God's got this. God's got it. Amen. Amen. Brother Benny, let's miss your prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we had to be here in your house today. And Lord, as we go through, teach us how to overcome the fear that keeps us from acting in your name. Lead us, Lord, to what we need to overcome that fear. Be brave 